Keep your Bibles open at John chapter 9, because we're going to study that a little bit. The Bible says that man is made in God's image. Humans are designed. We're not gods, but we're designed with a similarity to the one true God. Children are like parents. Each one is unique. They possess traits that echo us. All of us represent something larger than ourselves. We're designed for eternal life, but we're not immortal yet. The world around us is changing. I don't know when it began changing so fast. Ideas of right and wrong are shifting, and even our kids are facing that. We, their parents, are often the most significant human agents capable of influencing them. They know us better than they know anyone else in their lives. Hopefully they've seen some goodwill in us toward them. I'm sure they've seen us not at our best. But hopefully they can receive something from us and be guided to think for themselves enough so that, so that they don't ride the societal conveyor belt through the cultural cookie cutter and end up as just another widget in this sad world. For a moment in time, we have opportunities to prepare them for good things. So our kids, our grandkids, even our grown kids, some of us have opportunities. They say it takes a village to raise a child. But you know, the village is pretty preoccupied doing Netflix and doing their telephone. It's a preoccupied village. I don't think it's very good at raising kids. Beliefs about this world and the nature of reality, they run a, a quite a wide range. There really isn't a village to raise your kid. Just vague imaginations about what community values should be. Some are almost orphans while mom and dad poke at their phones. Others are staring obsessively at the screen. Sometimes the ones staring obsessively at the screen are kids. People choose fascination. People choose illusion. And so I welcome you to the grand illusion. Life, at the end of this age, life is a citizen of GAFA. You know what GAFA is, right? Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. For those of you that aren't online, those are some of the largest corporations. And they control a lot of our cell phones and things we buy. You are a citizen of GAFA. You didn't know that, but... Welcome. It's not all bad. It's just that it's so, a lot of it is so empty calorie, so mundane. Is this all that is? Some people think it is. One of the highest callings is to be a parent. And I would add to that and say that one of the higher callings also is to be a grandparent. Because therefore, when you are that, a parent or a grandparent, you are your kid's go-to person for moral questions. Now, they do tend to go through a phase where it's like, no, you're not. <laughs> but God put us in that place. And people need that. People need that. There are so many voices. There are so many ideas. How shall we live? Where can we find answers that are more than just opinions? You know, if you take a really good opinion and you, you put a nice frame around it and you cover it in velvet and you shine flashing lights on it, at the end of the day, guess what? It's, it's just another opinion. There's a lot of opinions in the world. The world needs baseline. The world needs, needs some truth. And so God has given us not the... Not the uh, the book of opinions, but he's given us the Bible, the Bible to show us what truth is. Where can we find answers that are more than just opinions? If we are trapped in a great illusion, how do we find the exit? There is a true story I think that we should think about. It's here in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. 
Jesus passes by a man who is blind. And think about it. If you're in an illusion, if you're engulfed in an illusion, in other words, what you're seeing is not reality, if, if that's what you're in, are you not a blind person? So, Jesus walks by a man who is blind. He has been blind from his birth. Everyone there that goes by that, that spot on the street, they're used to him being there. They're, they're familiar with his presence. Oh, that's the blind guy. He's been there for years. Don't think They don't think a second thought about it. He's always there in his place. They've even forgotten how long he's been there. But whenever they walk down the street at that time of day, there he is. But Jesus sees him, and Jesus' attention is drawn towards him. Yeah. Jesus' attention toward him draws the disciples' attention. So the disciples are kind of coming along with Jesus, you know. And they're all kind of going down the street. And the disciples see that Jesus is looking at this guy as he's walking along and the disciples the disciples notice this not processing well the human condition and not not really demonstrating an overabundance of empathy for the blind the disciples ask Jesus a theological question who sinned looking at this man who sinned that this man was born blind It's not, a, it's not a personal question. It's kind of an impersonal, theoretical, theological question. Jesus' answer then surprises them. Jesus' answer is basically none of the above. Huh. None of the above. Jesus often gives an answer like that, doesn't he? It's not that this person sinned while he was still a baby in, in the womb. It's not that his parents had sinned. This man had not been born blind as a divine punishment. He was not cursed by God, but rather, Jesus tells them rather, why, verse 3, John 9, verse um, 3, because this whole chapter is addressing this. Why was he born blind? It was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. That's why. Not to glorify the devil, not to curse, not because God was punishing this little innocent babe, but God allowed him to be born blind so that his, God's works would be displayed in him and what's about to happen. That's an interesting answer. See, he had been born blind because he, as we are, he was born into a world of sin. He was born into a world in which fallen angels influence humans and in which the great chain of consequence links one deed to another. A world then thousands of years downstream from Eden with declines in health, mutations in DNA, and increasing genetic defects. And add into that whole mix, what else have you got? You've got a bunch of humans running around, and some of them are doing nonsense. You know, one of the areas of research into viruses is called uh, gain, I'm trying to remember it now, gain of function. Gain of function research. Is that what it's called? I might not have the phrase just right. The, uh, in other words, there are people who are researching diseases and viruses so that they can understand better how it works, which is probably good if you're trying to find a cure. But it might be bad if you're part of the military industrial complex and you're trying to figure out how to infect people with viruses. 
so you add to the mix of all the, all the things that have just been declining, you add these humans that are some degree of smartness, you know, and we're kind of mischievous people. Some of, some of us are getting into trouble and trying to figure out more how to make a, a bomb explode bigger and better, how to make a virus worse and worse. And into this mix, we've been born into this world, mutations, genetic defects. So yes, this is, this is a dangerous place to be. Earth is a dangerous place. Earth is the most dangerous place in the universe. Welcome to your neighborhood. Nevertheless, God did not will that this man be born blind or that, that anyone be born blind. That was not part of his plan. But he permitted it. If he always intervened, we would never see the badness of sin because its consequences would all be intercepted and rectified and you'd never know about the bad pieces. We'd all be really, really we'd be in the grand illusion. Nothing wrong with sin. Hey, we've never seen any bad results from sin. Have you? No, I haven't. Well, but no, God didn't leave us with that. But now Jesus is come, and in this case, he's going down the street. He sees the blind man, and in this case, he says, I will intervene. And he doesn't heal this man directly, but he commands him to go to a certain place and watch. And you're looking at really the whole chapter of John here, which you don't have time to read in this moment, but I hope you're regularly reading through your Bible, and that sometime fairly recently you've read through the Gospel of John. You know, I'm doing these five-minute, they're all less than five-minute devotionals each morning on the Internet. And I was looking at that and saying, let's see, they're about four minutes on average. So if you go through seven of those, you're going to get around 28 minutes, kind of like a short sermon. So, but if somebody is watching those every day, if you're watching five minutes of a devotional, and then you're watching two hours of other stuff, yeah, good luck with that. It's challenging. We want good pieces. So Jesus comes. He's going to intervene. So read your Bible through so that you know what's going on, what the reality is. So Jesus commands this man to go to a certain place and wash. In other words, what does he do? What's the baseline? What's he really doing? He is giving this man a test of obedience and faith. They always go together. Obedience and faith. The blind hears the command, and what does he do? He immediately, vision was renewed. Yes, yes. He washes in the place that Jesus commands, and when he followed Jesus' command, what happened? His vision was renewed. That's right. He can create planets. He can recreate your vision. The next 21 verses recount this story of the investigation of this man's identity because that a notable miracle had been done was quite clear. Sight restored to the blind. So this had to be investigated. And as they investigate this, and this is John chapter 9, they confirm that he was born blind. But he's, he's being questioned. They confirm that he was born blind. He's, he's questioned about it, and then he's thrown out of the synagogue. Our interest today is really, and some of that's quite interesting stuff there. I encourage you to read it. But I want to put our focus today really on the last seven verses of this story, which is verses 35 to John chapter 9, verses 35 to 39. Let me read it to you yet again. Here are these verses I want to put our special attention on. Jesus heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who was talking to you. And he said, 
Lord, I believe. And he proskuned, he bowed down, he worshipped him. Right there in the street. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Jesus cares. Jesus heard what was done to this person. If there was anybody who was busy, Jesus. Who was more busy than Jesus? But Jesus, whatever he was doing at that time, he stopped. He went through the city and he found this guy. He sought him out. Who was busier than Jesus? But Jesus heard what had happened. He made it a point to find this man, this man who had been thrown out of the synagogue. When he found him, he didn't keep things at the level of small talk. Oh, it's so good to see you. How nice is it? It's nice weather today. Jesus asked him the biggest question that he could ask him. Do you believe in the Son of Man? That is the biggest question anybody can be asked, and that is the biggest question anybody can answer. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Few people today would think this is the largest question. The largest question is calculated always from a secular standpoint. Will artificial intelligences wipe out human life? Will human engineered climate change render parts of the planet uninhabitable? Will a passing asteroid strike the Earth at random? Will dangerous new, uh, by the way, three years ago I presented this. So this is before COVID. Will dangerous new bird viruses cross over and kill big patches of the population? I wrote three years ago. Will Justin Bieber tweet a new photograph of himself? The big questions. The man who had been blind his whole life until the past few days, Jesus sought him out and he asked him, do you believe? Do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in the Son of God? The biggest questions we face are not impersonal. They are personal. This is a personal question. The Bible shows us God is a personal being. There is one God. There are three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is a real person. Jesus is the Son of Man. The ultimate question is the same for each of us individually. Do I believe on the Son of Man? That is the question that is not to be asked. Secular, that's not a secular question to ask. We wouldn't ask that question. Do you believe in the Son of Man? They would throw you out for asking that question. No, you don't ask that question. But that is our question, right? How do I relate to the creator? How do I relate to God who became creature and died on the cross to satisfy the penalty for my sins and who rose again and who is alive today and whose primary activity today in all the cosmos is what? Is to work to open my eyes. There are other forces. Angels originally created pure and holy, but God gave them something he also gave to us, free will. Some decided they were as smart as God. They, though they, those mere creatures, that they should have the rights of God too, and some rebelled against the goodness of his rule. God did not immediately blot them out of existence. He could have. He could have done it in, a, in less than a blink. None would have known. He could have simply willed them out of existence with a thought. They would have been eliminated. Just, whoop, they're not there no more. He could have stripped from the minds of those who remain any memory that they'd ever been there. No memory of the existence of those rebels. You know, it's as if they never were. 
God could have just solved it that way, you know? Done. It's a lot cleaner, isn't it? Might not even be a cross there to die on. Just clean up the mess. All done. God didn't choose to do it that way. All of God's infinite power is mediated by the fact that he is a being who, a being who has moral lines. He has infinite wisdom, and he knows what's right, and he knows what wrong is. He is good in his very essence, and he refuses to act, refuses to act wrongly. God understood that the convenient solution would not only be evil in itself, to just blink people out of existence that got in the way, but he knew that it would never solve the problem of free beings choosing right and wrong in a moral universe. Couldn't solve it that way. It would have to be a lot of times when he did the, okay, you're blinked out. He'd have to reset several times. Because this can't solve it. The sin problem has to have an enduring solution, no resets. So, God works. He waits. He acts through his agents, angels who have not rebelled. And who else? Who are some of the other agents that God works through? That's right. Us, us mischievous, troublemaking, silly, bizarre, weird. Humans do weird stuff. You ever think the angels might look at each other and say, Did you see him do that? That was really weird. Where do they get those ideas? But God works through us. Humans, people, you and I. He demonstrates what happens when people believe in the Son of Man. In our life, he demonstrates it. He works in terms of evidence, changed lives, the consequence of evil compared to the consequence of good. And then what does God do? What does God give the whole universe? Not that the universe deserves it, but God says, I'm going to give you evidence. Evidence for what happens when you have badness and you, you let it ripen. Evidence for what happens when you have goodness and what happens when goodness ripens. And God is putting it all out there. All the cards are face up. God provides evidence. Satan hides evidence, doesn't he? Totally different. Totally different. The fallen angels led by Lucifer, you know, they're also very busy. They are just busy, busy. Again, the big questions are not about climate change or Justin Bieber or Bieber. I don't know how to say his name. The biggest question is, will these humans made in God's image believe on the Son of Man? That's the big question. That's the question. These fallen angels, they work to their utmost to confuse, to distract, to make busy every soul. Their goal is to prevent us from seeing the beauty of truth. Their goal is to make sure that you're blind. The world is out of order. Things are not right. Things aren't, things aren't fitting right. Cancer doesn't fit here. Why is it here? Blindness doesn't fit in a perfect creation. Why is it here? A melted down nuclear reactor vessel contaminating the Pacific Ocean doesn't fit here. Why is it here? Confusion about male and female, that's not part of God's plan in the created order. Why is it here? These fallen angels influence us as much as they can. They lead us, if they can, to choose sin, to choose to disregard God's revealed will. Sin can triumph only by enfeebling the mind and by destroying the liberty of the soul. And that's their work. Take away your liberty. Every which way they can. Freedom is not on their list for you. 
Sin can triumph only by enfeebling the, the mind and destroying liberty. To lead us to choose wrongly, to choose distortion, to choose what will reduce us from the moral to the animal. That's the business of these fallen angels. In essence, to make sure that you and I stay blind. And I'll tell you whose blood pressure went up the most. I don't know if angels have blood, but when Jesus was walking down the street and he saw that blind person, and it was clear that Jesus' attention was put on that blind person, the devils that were standing nearby, their blood pressure or whatever must have gone up really high because they did not want that blind person to learn how to see, to be given the gift of sight. They don't want any of us to see. And that's why the devils don't want you to read the Bible. Because if the remedy for blindness is the word of God, and we can see this is his revealed will. This is an understanding of life revealed, revealed religion, revealed supernaturally to us. I salve in a sense, your Bible. So make sure you don't read it and you can stay plentifully blind. They want to destroy us. They want to reduce us from the moral to the animal. And you know what? They're fighting against God. They seek our destruction. This is not theoretical. This is not a future contest, you know, somewhere way... The end will come somewhere way down that way, you know, 380 years. No. The race is on, and every single one of us is headed for the finish line. And what do you think? You think the end could happen in our lifetime? When you look at the world, you wonder how it might, how it could not happen in our lifetime. God loves us. He's working to change us. He wants to help us choose his ways, the ways of life. Do you believe in the Son of Man? This is the biggest question. When Jesus asked him this question, the man whose eye defect was corrected said, Lord, I believe. Remember what he said? Well, who is he so that I can worship him? Lord, I believe. He bowed down there, right there, right in the road in front of Jesus. And he worshiped him. If you were on a busy street in Grand Rapids or Muskegon or somewhere, and you came up and you truly met Jesus, be willing to bow down to him on the sidewalk? We say we would. I hope we would. There's some that might not. So this blind man saw the beauty of truth. Not the physical appearance of Jesus. But the generous goodness of Jesus' act in healing him. He had been blind, and now he could see. This is why Jesus in our scripture says, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Those who think they see. Those who see the grand illusion and think it's reality. So here's the baseline. God gives sight to those willing to receive sight. Is that too complicated? He reveals moral beauty, clarity about right and wrong. He heals. He changes lives. He lurks quietly along the sides of our lives, 
working, making opportunities, in intervening and opening doors, shining light, and we choose. We choose our questions. And one day, we are parents zooming through life at breakneck speed. Age lines are coming in. Hairline is receding. Kids are transforming into adults before our eyes. We look around ourselves, and we see we've been missing the questions that matter. It's not bad when we see that. It's good. Because this is exactly why Jesus came into our world. Yes, he came to die for us. He came to make atonement for us. But first, so that those who do not see may see. Presumably, since we're all here in God's sanctuary today to worship him, and we've given our heart to the Lord Jesus, we are, we are those who see. But out through those doors, just a few feet, there's a whole bunch of people who are trapped in the grand illusion. You go through those doors with hope. Challenges, troubles, but hope. A lot of people outside this building have a very low hope tank. I want to thank you for being thinkers. Thank you for letting your brain uh, live outside the box of secular thought. Thank you for living up to your moral component, to trying to know what God's will is and to be right. Thank you. Thank you for being open and interested in, well, we can't say this word, truth. Thank you for seeking life in a world that's, can we be honest, a world that's mostly about death. That's a pretty dark picture of this world, but I think, I think I'm willing to say that. Sorry. Thank you for being interested in the moral. Thank you for caring about right and wrong, and thank you for that you want to help your kids and your grandkids and your neighbors find truth in a world of lies. Because God will use angels. He'll use his Holy Spirit. And he's going to use some very strange humans. He's going to use us. Even though, I don't know if angels have eyebrows that go up when they, God calls us humans, but like the angel will go, Really? But no, the angels know. The angels know the plan. God wants to use you and me. The source of truth is not in ourselves. The source is in God. To conclude, God intervened in our world to give us an inspired book unlike any other. The Bible, not the Quran or some of these other things. When a man, when a woman surrenders to Christ, that is when there is freedom. When the creature admits he's a creature and bows down before his creator, that's when there is freedom. When the designed combines his life with the designer, capital D, that's when there's wholeness. So what will it be? Citizens of GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Uh, I use all four of those. Or it uses me. But not just that. What will it be, reality or illusion? The world as it authentically is or as others have portrayed it? Jesus came to disabuse people of their illusions. He came to change people's view of God. The grand illusion, we can embrace it 
We can become part of it. Or we can seek truth in a world that laughs at truth and be okay with that. I am okay with being laughed at. If it's God's truth that's on the line and people are going to laugh at me, I'm okay with that. Are you okay with that? Remember, this illusion will not last. It is a grand illusion. That's not the grand reality. It's the grand illusion. In fact, in a way, it's already over. And I want you to know this. Jesus wants to touch our eyes. He doesn't want anybody to be blind. He's a very good God. May we seek that touch. May we learn more about Jesus from the Bible and from a personal communication with him in our day-to-day -day life. And may we have the answers we need to help our children and grandchildren and neighbors Help them to be freed from a cold and empty human view of the world that they inhabit. May God be our helper and guide as we help others find their way to the exits. And the exit is at the cross.